Hola, matey peeps. Hello, good day. Welcome to Joe Wadsack's Drinks Coach. Um, some people watching this might be surprised to know that I have never done a video blog before. This is my first ever one. Uh, I am so bored. Uh, I've no balcony, I've got no barbecue. I'm looking at Wandsworth Common, uh, which is just a tease, if anything. Um, and I thought I'd just get off my fat ass and finally learn how to do this. Hundreds of people have asked me to do it in the past. Hopefully this will come to something. Uh, friends of mine and old colleagues uh, and I got together um, and they're helping me fund um, a video blog that hopefully will go for a while. Um, we're calling it Drinks Coach. It'll go out Monday to Friday every week. And hopefully every night I'll have something humorous, if not informative, to say. Um, so what was I going to do about the first one? What were you going to do your first ever video blog on? Um, stemware. Very contestable issue, um, stemware. And uh, a lot of people think it matters. Uh, a lot of people don't think it matters. They're wrong. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you a bit about glasses and why there's a difference. Why it makes a difference. Um, so where do we start with all of this? Well, here's a glass, which I've been using. Uh, this is called an ISO 9002 glass. It looks like a Spanish sherry glass, which they call a capita. Um, but the width, the height, the thickness of the glass, everything in this glass is written down in um, science law um, at the SI Standards Unit um, offices in Gunnersbury and Chiswick and in Paris. Um, they're the people that have a lump of plutonium, which is exactly one kilogram. It defines what a kilogram is. They define uh, the speed of light. And they also define what an ISO 9002 international tasting glass is, which is this. Why on earth? Well, the whole point is, if I'm in Chile or Alaska or Tasmania, drinking whatever great variety or whatever time in the morning, noon or night, after being jet lagged, um, it means that I'm using the same glass no matter where I am in the world. So it gives me a, a direct reference point, uh, which is a very scientific approach. And also, these glasses are very good for that. They're very, very good at analysing wine. Um, they break things down to their component parts rather well. You can see it's not a big glass. Um, and you're probably wondering, well, why, don't, why doesn't everybody have a set of these glasses? Well, uh, two really strong reasons. Number one, uh, it doesn't make wine taste good. It actually breaks the wine down so you can see the faults better. So if it tastes good in that it tastes good in a vase and uh you're probably better drinking it out of an ashtray or something um but this is a, a a glass which you don't want in restaurants either i'll explain why you always pour wine to the widest part of the glass because that gives the most aroma uh and as you can see that's hardly a glass is worth is it it's more like a shot of tequila or something um this is you can probably see there's um, some logoing on this. I nicked this off a friend of mine who makes very, very good sparkling wine in uh, Hampshire. And uh, there's even a line on here which uh, shows you where to pour it to, um, which is perfect if you're using it for analysing wine. Uh, don't discount this glass if you're learning to be a master of wine student and blind tasting uh, or um, court of ma the master sommelier exams. Um, but if you're, if you're wanting to enjoy wine, this isn't the glass for you. Um, glasses for drinking tend to flatter the wine and tend to push the wine in the right direction, which I'll explain to you in due course. Um, and by the way, these are never going to be longer than 10 minutes, by the way. Uh, I've got six and a bit minutes to go. So you can always squeeze them into, you know, a little ad break on Dave, which is about 20 minutes, isn't it? Okay, so <clears throat> let's start off with this glass. No, I couldn't be asked to wash them up because I've done so many takes of this, I'm starting to get bored. Um, so this is... um. Uh, my standard tasting glass is the glass I use every day. It's a Riedel from Austria. Georg Riedel makes a whole range of specialist wine stems, glasses for wine. Um, uh, there's, there's hundreds of them. Uh, I think there's like seven for Chardonnay alone. But this is the water glass. This is the glass on the table they use for pouring water in. The reason why I like this glass, very short stem, doesn't break, doesn't leave a cathedral of glass on the table when you're tasting, doesn't snap. And if as you can see the bowl, it's actually the same shape as their sort of like unoaked white wine glass, their Sauvignon Blanc glass or their Chianti Classico glass. So it's ideal for me. Um, it's kind of down the line. It makes wines which are supposed to be crisp, crisp enough. And it makes wines that are round and soft and maybe oaky and richer soft and oaky and rich enough it's real down the line glass which is what i'm after i don't want a glass to flatter the wine too much um uh, so so what difference does the glass make well first of all having a good glass counts if you're going to buy a bottle of wine for tenner these, these days that's kind of a cheap wine isn't it that's what it's called with entry um and you have a glass like this which we'll come on to in a minute this is a zalto 
One of the finest glasses known to mankind. Super thin, very posh, very expensive. People are scared they'll break them, but they just don't break. Um, that's 45 quid. But that's only four and a half bottles of branded Australian wine, isn't it? Um, it's, it's crazy that people could buy a bottle of wine that costs 50 or 60 pounds and drink it out of a petrol station glass. I mean, lunacy. Um, when it's so cheap to buy good glasses, it's like playing really great music on a, on a single mono tape cassette recorder. The glasses are your hi-fi for your wines. And if you don't use good glasses, you're not a wine enthusiast. Um, it's just stupid. It's a minimal cost uh, if you drink as much as I do. So, here's two glasses. Here's one wine. I shall pour the wine into both glasses. There we go. What's happening when I pour these two wines into my mouth is very different. If I swirl this glass and then sniff it, my nose gets quite close to the surface of the wine. In fact, if I tilt it slightly, because my nose is big enough to get in this huge great gap in the front, my nose is almost on the surface, so it can smell slightly yeasty characteristics, a lot of alcohol. Um, I get the smells of what I'm supposed to get, and this is a Californian Sauvignon Blanc, not a bad one actually. Um, and uh, it just smells like it should, it just smells like Sauvignon Blanc. Now, when I taste it, What's happened is I've poured the wine into my mouth, but I haven't tipped my head like that because my nose fits in the glass. The wine gets poured into the bottom of my mouth, hitting the sides of my tongue first, which is where we perceive, if, if it's not what actually happens, is where we perceive acidity and zinginess. If you're drinking Sauvignon Blanc or a nice sparkling wine or a Riesling or a Chenin Blanc, you're after zing and twang. And this glass gives you enough but not a great amount it's actually if anything probably more suited to rounder wines like chardonnay if i take this glass which is much more like a white wine glass in fact it's basically a pregnant sparkling wine glass i love this glass by the way it comes from some friends who make sparkling wine in italy uh, named after a car manufacturer or well, not after in fact they were named it first um if i swirl this and then put my nose into it you'll see that my nose is quite a long way away from the surface of the wine. So only the short, light, aromatic congeners, which are lifted in the alcohol, get to my nose. So I don't smell all the funky ones at the bottom. All I'm smelling is the elderflower and the, the grasses and the, the blue tits uh, frolicking in the hedge. Um, it's a very, very good way to make sure that you get the simple, crisp aromatics first. Um, but also, when you pour the wine to your mouth, When I tilted my head back, I'm almost looking at the ceiling. Can you see that? The wine is poured into the centre of my tongue, which means it leaches to the sides of the tongue second, which means my overall lasting impression is of acidity, zinginess and freshness. So just by changing the glass, it's not how it smells, this wine tastes more like Sauvignon than this does. Might be a surprise. Try it at home. OK, so I've already shown you this glass, uh, which is... My, uh, my poshest glass. Um, thank you. Shout out to Ben Stevenson at the Hanging Ditch who get, bought me two of these for my wedding. Wish I, I had the other one still. Um, but also I've got this glass, which is for um, one of my favourite grape varieties, Pinot Noir. Um, it's for, for Burg Burgundies, which are made from Pinot Noir, but also it's very good for white Burgundy. Very good for Barolo and Barbaresco, made from Nebbiolo, a variety which in many ways shares a lot of properties that Pinot Noir does. And also the more rounded, softer varieties like uh, Grenache, Garnacha, so that'd be Priorat or Chateau de Pape. Let's pour some wine in the glass. This is a, let's call it a Pinot Noir glass for the sake of argument. And I'll pour a bit in each one. That's about the same amount of wine. Still got a minute. Okay, so if I swirl this wine, what's happening is that the wine is in the glass is quite narrow, um, which means that the wine sort of uh, collumates and actually separates out in the glass. So First thing I smell is some cherry fruit, a bit of tar. If I tilt it further back, I can smell the earthy, uh, oaky notes of the, of the wood used. There's a, almost a forest floor undergrowth character, but it's separated out. Now in a Bordeaux, which is what this glass is designed for, that's brilliant. You want to see the individual components of the Merlot, the Cab, the Cab Franc, the Petit Verdot. Even in a straight Cabernet Sauvignon, there's so many complexities. It's actually quite nice to see them separated out. But in my uh, Solcum Gin um, fish tank, which is what I put half a pint of gin in every weekend with a load of ice, um, which is my favourite Pinot Noir glass in the house, um, when you put your nose in, it's almost on the surface of the wine. And all those layers, because it's a broader glass, are, are compressed They're together. So when I sniff, I sniff them all at the same time. And it's an orchestra of smells. It's a peacock's tail of smells. You can smell lots of different things going on. When I put the wine in my mouth, 
That's time. That's 10 minutes. It's like a duvet. Oh, it's delicious. See you next time. <laughs>